Do you think that generating 1500 characters on every mouse move event basically hundreds of times per second can work fast? What about mobile phones? What if we turn on CPU throttling? This is a Sterna DUI, the most hyped up library right now. But is the hype justified? We will discuss tech stack and its dependencies, license, dark mode, performance, usability, accessibility and responsiveness. It's built with Next.js, but to be honest I don't think this dependency is essential. It doesn't bring any special value and I would prefer the default version to be vanilla React, which sounds funny but here we are frontend 2024 but actually you can use this library without next.js a lot of components don't even have next.js dependency and even if they have it's probably something as basic as image that you could easily remove and replace with regular html speaking of react there is already a port from react to svelte that is using svelte motion instead of framer motion and having the entire code of each component you can port it to other frameworks yourself for example using view use motion for view tailwind Wind and Framer Motion are a must, and there's the guide how to set it up. But importantly, each component can have more dependencies based on their individual needs. Some tiny utilities like CLSX and Tailwind Merge, and bigger stuff like TS Particles or Simplex Noise. By the way, if you want to have a dark mode, there is no guide on that in here. But those components are dark mode ready, and you can follow the guidelines from ShotCN UI, which will work pretty much the same. The library is built by Externity, which is a web dev studio run by Manu Aurora. Sorry if I'm butchering the name. He has a great sense of humor so I hope you will understand. They use it to promote their paid services which confuses some people but the library itself is completely free, MIT license for both personal and commercial projects. And I mentioned their page because they also have a very nice blog where you can find some in-depth articles on how they build some of those components. The main difference between this library and others is that it's focused on aesthetic animations. That's why frame motion is used, that's what all the hype is about and you have to admit those components are just gorgeous. There is a lot of comparisons between this library and ShotCN UI, mainly because it's incorporating the same interesting trend of own your components. Basically what it means is that we are moving away from UI libraries installed via npm that lands in your node modules directory to manually copy pasting code into our repositories, just like everyone did in the 90s. This has some benefits of course, as ShotCN himself explains, one of the drawbacks of packaging the components in an npm package package is that the style is coupled with the implementation. The design of your components should be separate from the implementation. But it has some drawbacks as well. Because imagine you copy all those components, you modify it for your needs, and in six months there is a new major release, and you have all those changes that are probably in conflict. Well, good luck with a maintenance hell. It's also important to note the differences between those libraries. The most important, I think, is that the mightiness of ShotCN UI one of the core reasons of its strength is coming from the fact it's based on Radix UI. This is an unstyled components library, or some people call it behavioral components library, because it is focused on behavior of components, leaving the styling for the consumers. ShotCN is adding beautiful Tywin styles, but under the hood it's the Radix UI that is guaranteeing correct battle-tested behavior and accessibility features for all of those components. And there is no such thing powering externity UI, but still we should discuss accessibility. This might sound like a nitpicking, but for a lot of people, some estimation says 15% of global population, it's really important topic. Let's look for example at MDN's ARIA documentation for tooltips. Scrolling a bit down, there is a paragraph associated WAI ARIA roles, states and properties. The element that serves as the tooltip container has role tooltip set, and the element that triggers the tooltip references the tooltip element with ARIA described by attribute. Actually, no component in the entire Externity collection has any ARIA attribute, so I guess this could be improved. Moreover, we can read that the tooltip should appear on focus or when the element is hovered on. And of course we can see it on hover, but I try to hit tab to iterate through those elements and I notice that they are not focusable at all. I've jumped to elements further on the page. So there is no response for tab keystrokes, there is no focus indication and obviously because of that there can be no tooltip appearing on focus, which is clearly against the guidelines. There is also no escape handling when I have a tooltip open and I want to close it with a keyboard. One more interesting thing that is actually implemented, the tooltip should stay open when hovered. It means when you move mouse from container that triggers the tooltip to the tooltip itself, it should not disappear. But did you see it? There is a little issue here. When I very slowly move mouse from the container to the tooltip, you can notice that it blinked. 
Not very pleasant, but just a tiny detail. And why did I mention Radix UI before? Well, if you need good accessibility with tooltips, that stuff was already figured out by Radix UI creators. And this is why ShadCN is using it underneath. All the things mentioned here are gracefully handled by tooltips from ShadCN. You can check yourself. And there are other small issues with accessibility here and there. Mostly with focus indication, keyboard accessibility, lack of alt attributes for images, lack of aria labels for components that reveal text content, things like that. But if you will take one thing from this video, let it be this. Prefers reduced motion is not widely known, but super important CSS media query. You see, when we open a page and there's a lot of movement on scroll, I will demonstrate it now, especially with two different scroll speeds at the same time, or even two different directions of the scroll, there are a lot of people who can actually feel bad because of it. Same as there are a lot of people who can feel carsick, seasick, or airsick. What can be a nice and pretty animation for some, for others it may induce feelings of sickness, cold sweats, nausea, vomiting, or even cause seizures. And seizures can be fatal. But even the ones that are only debilitating can be of such severity that they render the user incapacitated. Other disorders such as disorientation, nausea, vomiting and more can also be so severe that the user is unable to function. Vestibular disorders, motion sickness, epilepsy, whenever you are experimenting with animations, you are exposing your users to risk. This special media query allows us, developers, to detect system level motion preferences and react to them. Settings that users exposed to risk can activate to tell us to turn off our animations. Here is a cheat sheet how to reduce animations in different operating systems if you are interested. Unfortunately, a standard UI doesn't have support for it yet. I hope they will add it in the future, but you can modify those components yourself. There is an entire page on this media query support in Framer Motion documentation. Just be mindful that not all animations in Asternity are done with Framer, so you might want to include a separate hook in React to detect this. I will link this example below. Sometimes when we look at rendered animations, we can see that they flicker, but it's hard to assess performance properly based only on our sight. Chrome DevTools have a very useful FPS monitor that you can open by Ctrl slash Command plus Shift plus P. Then type FPS and hit Enter. You can see it in the left corner. Users are generally happy when animations run at 60 fps. When it drops below this level, this is when we can probably spot some flickering. Right now it looks fine, because I'm running it on my desktop. But remember tablets, mobiles, especially older mobile phones, they can have much worse CPUs. We can actually simulate it by CPU throttling in DevTools. You can find it in Performance tab. Click on the cog icon if it's hidden, and we can see what happens on 4 times slowdown, 6 times slowdown, FPS monitor is one thing, but we can visually confirm something is not right here. From my observations, all components based on Particles.js have problems with performance. And this is not because of the externality. Particles.js itself has a problem when CPU throttled. As a separate example, let's look at Evervolt cards. The idea here is that it's regenerating random 1500 characters long strings on each mouse move. Mouse move events are generally triggered very fast. It can easily trigger more than 100 events in a single second. And because this is React, the implementation here calls set state with new random string on each event. Let that sink in. The whole component is re-rendering on each mouse move event. Hundreds of renders per second. So let's see how it behaves. Performance tab, CPU throttling, 4 times slowdown, and let's just open FPS monitor. Well, 4 times throttling shows that frames are dropping, but it's still way above 60 FPS, and it's pretty smooth for the human eye. 6 times slowdown, well, it's still around 50 FPS, which is pretty decent. So there you have it, a final blow to the React haters saying that React is slow. But seriously, there are components in this library that actually handle throttling pretty well. There are many different definitions of user experience, but four main parts that are usually underlined are accessibility and performance, which we already have covered, visual design or aesthetics, which is probably the first thing that comes into your mind when you think about web design, and usability or functionality. Sometimes those terms are treated separately and other times jointly. I will refer to them as the same thing, meaning the measure of simplicity and effectiveness in which users can accomplish their goals. We need to be mindful that adding all those components don't necessarily increase our app's usability. Things like scroll hijacking, 
While it can be nice, I personally find it frustrating. When I enter your page, I want to find that information quickly, not having to scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll for some visual effect. So if you want to add it, maybe add it at the bottom of the page, just as DeepMind did with its Gemini effect. Direction aware hover. While it's nice, I'm rather skeptical about hiding content on hover. I was once making a complicated form where we were adding these little information icons that were displaying important instructions on hover. And guess what? 90% of users were not hovering on them and they didn't know how to complete the form properly. If the information is important, just show it up front. There are no arrows to control cards in the card stack. The same in infinite moving cards. Okay, I can stop the animation on hover, but I've read the card already and now I have to wait for another card. Or what if I want to go back to the card that already moved away? People don't have time to wait for your animations. So those are some examples of things that I believe could be frustrating for the users. Maybe there is more, just take it into account. Finally, responsiveness. I think that generally the author made a very good job with it. Just look at those animated tabs. It really scales pretty well. And there is even a horizontal scroll on the tabs. But there are also some glitches. Background beams seems not to work at all in mobile view. It's not that bad because nothing wrong happens when they don't show up. But for example, things like lamp section or sparkles. The ratio of elements is not preserved and doesn't look that good when it scales down to the mobile view. I mean, this line for example, it's suddenly taking 100% of width and the text itself is much smaller in relation to the sparkles. There are also things that don't make a lot of sense on mobile, like the text reveal card. There is no hover on mobile, of course. Clicking on the component actually reveals the text, but the experience is questionable to say the least. So to sum up, if you use those components, make sure to test responsiveness extensively. All in all, some things that I've mentioned are details. I think that generally, Externity is a great collection of components. Some of those effects are really bleeding edge of what's happening in UI trends right now. So special kudos to the author Manu, follow him on Twitter as a token of appreciation. But also, be careful with using too much of this stuff in your app. Look at the YouTube for example. There are not a lot of animations to begin with, and if there is one, it's just there to give you this little spark of joy when you hit the subscribe button. So hit it and thanks for watching. See you next time.